Uh, hi, my name is uh, Nima Sarandaji, and I'm going to talk about my latest book, The Henry Fords of Healthcare. This book was published by the Institute of Economic Affairs last year during the corona epidemic. It's not about corona, but it's about the um, health, the future of health. And currently, um, health policy is at the focus of everybody because of this terrible uh, global pandemic. However, equally important, if you, we have a long-term view coming out of this uh, horrible pandemic, is that f for decades, studies have shown that various uh, Western countries uh, have significant problems in um, healthcare delivery within their welfare states. Uh, simply put, it's, it's not sustainable. The costs are uh, not under control long-term. And a real progress is happening elsewhere. The Henry Fords of healthcare are not found in the Western countries. They're not found in Sweden. They're not found in the US. Even in the Netherlands, which has a very good balance in the healthcare model, we don't really see them. We see them instead in India, Thailand, China, Brazil, Singapore, Korea. Um, countries mostly, I would say, to the east, although Brazil isn't really east, it's more west. But countries that don't have a Western style healthcare system. That's where the progress is happening. Now, the health systems of Western countries are plagued, unfortunately, by inefficiency and, more importantly, low productivity growth, which over time is creating more and more problems. The latter one, the low growth of productivity. This is just to show, this graph shows how health um, expenditure have increased um, over time and also elderly care expenditure have increased as share of GDP. And the, the major issue with efficiency is important to understand. Now, basically, it's, it's the Bowman's cost disease. Bowman's cost disease happens when you have a health delivery model or any public uh, sector delivery model which is stuck in a system. So it doesn't change. And what happens is that the economy as a whole becomes more productive and the wages are increased to reflect that. And when all the wages go up, also, also for healthcare, um, the wages need to go up so that people go and work in healthcare. But there is no productivity growth to speak of. And then it's the cost is increasing instead of the efficiency increasing. Um, the wages go up with the same efficiency and then the cost increases. And the cost increases so high that it is actually higher than the rate of economic growth. So even though societies become richer every year, more prosperous, uh, the, their cost of healthcare goes up so that it becomes more and more difficult to support the healthcare and more and more taxes are needed to support that. Now, I just want to give a short, brief, historic uh, context. In the same way that enterprise has a very long history and the history of enterprise did not start in the West, it started in the East, again with healthcare we see that okay, a thousand, at least a thousand years ago we go to the Middle East, we had the uh, golden market renaissance period for the Middle East then, and then we see the development of uh, what we could say the first maybe modern hospitals, and they were private. Uh, there was definitely public funding in them to support health for people who couldn't afford it themselves, as has been the case for, I think, any society through history. That there is um, public healthcare funding, but the hospitals have historically been run privately. And the pharmacies, which have a very long history, again, in the Middle East, also China, India, these countries, have also been run privately. So, and they were offering healthcare also. The, the idea of publicly planning the healthcare system, almost like it's a, the government has to plan it, that's a relatively modern co concept with shortcomings. Now, since we are in the corona pandemic, obviously there is a role for the state um, in healthcare, not least during a pandemic, but that the public sector should run the hospitals is causing massive problems for the European countries over time. So basically, organizational changes such as economics of scale and high levels of specialization, which are adopted in the rest of the economy, are not penetrating the healthcare system. And that's creating the situation where costs are not under control, and gradually every year it becomes more and more difficult to finance healthcare in Western context. 
and the quality isn't really going up either as much as it could. But this is a Western problem. India, China, Middle East, Singapore, and so on have given way to the Henry Fords of healthcare, which are, and these guys are entrepreneurs who have changed healthcare delivery. Uh, my book is about them. You can read it. It's on the um, Institute of Economic Affairs website. I'm just really going to um, talk about one of these examples of the Henry Fords of healthcare, and, but there are many more. And this is the guy, so this is uh, David Chetty. So this guy grew up in India, and when he was in school, he heard about the first um, cardiac surgery in South Africa. As a child, he said, when I grow up, I want to become a heart surgeon. Now, short, uh, long story short, he grows up and he studies in India, he studies abroad, he becomes a very good heart surgeon. He, among others, was the heart surgeon of uh, Mother Teresa. But he realizes that in India, uh, the, the problem is so bad that many people who are poor, and many are poor in India, particularly back when he, a um, couple of decades ago, when many people heard that they were going to die uh, because of their heart, uh, they wouldn't even ask <clears throat> if they could get a heart surgery. They would just say, no, it's too expensive. Even with government support, it was too expensive. So David Chetty realized, wait a minute, the cost has to radically decrease so that Indians who are poor also can get heart surgery. And then he went uh, and um, in his family, he looked for startup capital and said, I want to run a, a hospital which is very, very specialized. And <clears throat> he got the money and he set up his first hospital, <clears throat> which is very much like Henry Ford. Uh, each room has a purpose. Each room has a staff. And basically, you come in, you meet some people, you get pre-treated, you go to the heart surgery, you go to recovery, you go out. And the, the doctors, not in, for example, as in Sweden, the doctors spend a lot of their time in their office filling in government papers, public bureaucracy. They don't do that. They don't either shift between tasks. They just do one thing again and again and again. Now, the result is high productivity and, interestingly, good results. Uh, if you read my book, there are many international business journals who have gone and, and looked at the David Chetty hospitals and said, wow, uh, one of them even found that even though the cost is much, 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 much lower than the U.S. heart surgeries, in fact, the survivability is a similar or even similar, higher, let's say the same, as in the US. Although the Indians being treated have much, much worse health, many of them are poor, they don't have good diets. So the treatments are good, and, and this standardized um, Henry Ford style of treatment actually is good. It, it ensures that people are really specializing. So what David Chetty did was, in his first hospital, he said, okay, let's do the same thing for eye surgery and cancer surgery. And uh, the Indian government uh, gave him a prize and said, you have invented the health city, a small city just with highly specialized hospitals. Now, his hospitals, he started many of them in India, Pakistan. Millions and millions of people are getting treatment. And there are a bunch of other people who have done the same thing in India, Thailand, China, Middle East. Um, I think Brazil also have some example. So it's not one person. But David Chetty is um, the most interesting one, I think, I've written most about him. Uh, a couple of years ago, he went to the Cayman Islands and started one of his health cities. And uh, he did that to be close to the U.S., but not be in the U.S. Because while we think that the U.S. is a free market country, when it comes to healthcare, it has uh, big problems. As basically almost all Western countries do, have designed bad healthcare system models. Uh, that don't allow innovation, really. But uh, David Chetty went to Cayman Islands not to be, you know, be outside the regulations, and he still treats patients from the U.S. and, I guess, Cayman Islands, and it's going very well, it seems. The concept is, is being exported to the West, which I think is very encouraging. Now, I want to uh, just look at this picture, which shows the optimism about the future of healthcare. 
when you measure optimism about anything in society, people in rich countries are optimistic because they're rich and their societies work, while people in uh, less developed economics are less optimistic because they live in countries which have economic problems. Many of the respondents in poor countries are poor. So, But when you ask about the optimism about the future of healthcare, you find that in uh, UK, Spain, Italy, 10% or less are optimistic. In Germany, Canada, Sweden, Australia, 20% or less. In France, Japan, Belgium, the US, a quarter or less. Actually, none of them is even a quarter. But then look at Brazil, 71%. India, 60%. Indonesia, 51%. China, 47%. There's something he happening here. These countries at top, and Turkey also at top, they have the Henry Fords of healthcare. They, they, they are, they're open for this kind of disruptive healthcare innovation. And, and there's optimism. I think that the West needs to learn from India, China, Middle East. A very simple lesson, allow radical innovation. Open up a trade of health. There's a massive uh, health tourism going on where people go to Thailand, India, Singapore. Thailand is very big. They, they go basically to hotels that are like spas. They get very good treatment. Uh, they go from Europe, from the uh, US, and f uh, often for much less than they would pay in their own countries. And, and you would say, okay, but the cost of labor is lower in Thailand. Well, that's part of it. But the main part is that the economics of scale are allowed, and th these hospitals in countries like India, in fact, they're so big and so successful that some of them have charities where poor people can get free healthcare. Not all of them, but some of them have it. They still are run massive profits, even though they give away some of the healthcare. And they're also doing a lot of um, research and development, world-leading research and development. Basically, the Henry Fords of healthcare have today created hospitals which are more, di more dynamic than, than the ones we find in the West. So anybody in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, countries that haven't really uh, locked themselves in a Western healthcare model, don't. Look at India and China instead. They have it right. While Sweden, for example, the central government debt is going down, central government expenditure is under control, but the, the municipal and regional economies, because the municipalities have elderly care and the regions have health care, um, they're just borrowing more and more and more money every year, and uh, the central government has to push money to them um, because the Beaumont's cost disease is creating a bad problem where the only way to finance future healthcare is to reduce other government costs and shift the money to he healthcare uh, and elderly care, and uh, also to just borrow more and more money to the municipalities and regions. Again, Corona changes the situation, but this trend has been going on for decades before the corona. Now, to understand healthcare innovation, uh, it's important to understand what is a disruptive innovation and what is an incremental innovation. It's not a very complex thing, really, just fancy words. Um, the razor and the electric shaver are the best examples. So Gillette sort of invented the modern razor. And what have they been doing? They have been incrementally adding more blades to it. You go back in time, you wouldn't find a Gillette with five blades. You would find four blades, three blades, two blades, and so on. That's incremental innovation. The electric shaver is disruptive innovation. Now, when the first electric shaver came, first of all, it was a new technology. It was a new way of shaving. It was not a better way of shaving, really. It was a cheaper way of shaving. You buy an electric shaver, you don't have to change the razor blades. That was the main feature of it. And what happens? Well, gradually, there's a, the, a, a market is created for electric shavers because you can save money on them. And then they gradually improve. And then people are like, OK, some people choose them. I don't, but some people choose them because they work 
pretty well and they are you know you don't cut yourself it's more convenient you, you don't have to buy the blades so but but then at some point there needs to be a complete change of how you you do the the shaving and even a drop in quality in this of how well you shave to get other benefits disruptive innovation allows for cost saving incremental innovation actually in, in fact increases costs it's more expensive to make a razor with five blades and four blades and so on uh, there are many examples of disruptive innovation in healthcare and in fact even Sweden which has a publicly funded healthcare largely with gradually increased role for private actors and even private funding um, before corona e-health came and the public since it's a public system they wouldn't allow this disruptive innovation but for years Swedish entrepreneurs fought to push it through and then finally it was sort of okay let's adopt it and then corona came and 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 um, uh, health via distance because of social distancing actually boomed um, we have robot surgery we have hospitals being specialized highly specialized like the David Chetty example uh, these are examples of um, of disruptive innovation in healthcare and uh, there are some policy lessons for the uh, for the world really first is don't go with this Western healthcare system uh, the US for example they have a huge problems with their healthcare system it's so regulated there are so many people suing each other over healthcare that a price for the consumer is really does not make any sense um, countries like Sweden uh, it's too much government command and control still even though they're opening up for the market learn from the East where where the Henry Fords of healthcare are able to transform healthcare to push up quality while the prices are under control uh, the, the West has simply got this wrong the command and control model and I think um, we're, we're going to see the shift towards uh, being inspired from India and China in this regard instead of being inspired by Western Europe and the US and as, as, as we clearly see be inspired from the countries where people are optimistic about the future of health and that's mostly the East the second policy lesson relates to two papers that I, together my colleague Gabriel Helle Salgren, are writing for Timbro. Uh, and uh, one of them is about new public management, and the other one is basically about um, the topic I'm speaking about today. Privatization in healthcare has been happening in Sweden, even in the UK with the NHS, slowly, it's very, very slowly, limited, but still. Privatization is good and it is needed and also new public management has been introduced in the public sector to deal with the shortcomings and inefficiencies. Uh, both of them can be good forces, it's not a guarantee but they can absolutely contribute positively and privatization does contribute. New public management is essentially that the public sector uh, takes in the management uh, practices from the private sector and tries to copy them. But this is not enough. If you just bring in private companies and say, okay, healthcare is government control. You have to do this, this way, this, this way, this, this way. You're not changing anything. In Sweden, for example, the private, um, uh, you can start a private uh, small um, health, um, not, not a hospital really, but, you know, a mini hospital and a clinic, I mean. And, uh, but then you have to follow all the government regulations. So the doctors have to spend so much of the time filling in paperwork because they become government bureaucrats. It's about opening up for disruptive innovation. It's about opening up for another way of providing healthcare, not have the doctors filling government papers half the time or a third of the time. That's the first step, obviously. So it's about disruptive innovation. There are many, the third policy lesson is there are many examples of health entrepreneurs combating COVID-19, learn from them. My brother was uh, traveling and he was in uh, Stockholm's uh, airport, main airport, Arlanda. And he said that in a hotel close by, 
uh, young Turkish guy, I think, had opened, uh, Swedish guy, Turkish origin, had opened, uh, he rented two rooms and he just set up a corona testing, rapid testing answer center, which everybody appreciates, you know, it's good in the corona times, the passengers are happy, uh, the public health care is alleviated. This is not something the public health care would have done. And if they had done it, the Swedish taxpayers would have paid millions of euros for it instead of an entrepreneur doing it and creating value. So, so COVID-19, while being very horrible in many ways, has, I think, opened a bit for innovation. So I think it's good to go back and look at the innovations and say, wait a minute, maybe we should embrace innovation even after uh, this um, COVID situation hopefully is handled through vaccinations. And the policy lesson four, command and control of health. Well, sometimes yes, if, if you have a pandemic, for example, and, and of course it needs to be regulated, but through history, health has been a business. Healthcare was not invented a hundred years ago in Europe. The centralist commanded healthcare welfare state model was invented. And it's not a very good well-functioning system. It's not a very good system. The West needs to relearn that through history, health has been a business. Society, government has regulated and also funded, uh, you know, to support people who can't afford it, etc. But the, the, the West needs to relearn that health is not something for the public bureaucracy to handle. That's not how it has been, and that's not how it can continue to be. Uh, during the coming decades, something will happen. Extending healthy lifespan, that's going to be the booming industry of the world. Already they've extended the lifespan of mouse five times, and um, uh, a couple of years ago they managed to um, actually rejuvenate mouse. And there's a lot of um, work in you know, getting this on cocker spaniels and soon on humans. Uh, so I think this will become a huge, huge marketplace. And, and what happens is essentially you see optional healthcare, healthcare treatments in order to live a longer, healthier life, going to a place and measuring all your biosigns. So centralist command and control of health will have a role, but uh, it's going to shift towards health entrepreneurship for multitude of reasons. And without health entrepreneurship, the West will really stagnate. So my book, The Henry Fords of Healthcare, I think you can just go to the Institute of Economic Affairs homepage and, and read it online. It's a short book. It discusses these concepts, and it points to the Henry Fords of Healthcare, these individuals in the Eastern context who are revolutionizing healthcare with the same very basic principles of um, capitalist production that Henry Fords and McDonald's and others have implemented, but with, with that the Western systems are just not allowing in healthcare. So this is the future of healthcare really. It's happening in the East, not in the West. Thank you.